Uh, as, uh, as you can see on your screen, hopefully, we're going to be talking about our new migration to Autodesk service. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. By the way, this uh, I was just noting earlier, this will likely not take the full hour, so we should uh, get through this, unless there's a ton of questions, which would be great, but um, we should be in good shape here in the allotted time. So just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Imagine It uh, a little over 25 years now. Background is in uh, surveying civil engineering. Been uh, working in the industry since the mid 80s. Yes, way back then, uh, where I started a, one of my summer jobs as a rodman and a survey crew. And next thing you know, it's uh, 2020, and here I am. So I've worked with uh, surveyors, civil engineers, uh, municipal uh, organizations, uh, commercial, um, and I've been on the uh, consulting side since uh, 1996. And um, uh, through the years, I've worked in various capacities as a, a technical instructor, as an applications expert. Um, and then now I've been for the last, uh, better part of the last 20 years or so, uh, managing the services organization uh, at Imagine It. So that's who I am. Let's talk about who we are, who Imagine It is. Imagine It is actually part of RAN Worldwide, which is our parent company. So Imagine It, of course, uh, if you've dealt with us before, you're probably familiar with our, our relationship with Autodesk and um, but we also work with other organizations like Archibus, Twin Motion, and like a Geosystems. Um, but in addition to Imagine It, under the RAND Worldwide umbrella is companies like RAND 3D, which specializes in providing uh, Dassault uh, solutions and PTC training. We have RAND Sim, which does simulation consultation with uh, ANSYS. And then Ascent is also part of the RAND Worldwide family. Uh, being the company that you've probably heard that name before because uh, Ascent is the division that creates the training materials that is used not only with Imagine It, but worldwide for organizations that do Autodesk training. So all of us are part of RAN Worldwide, and of course the Imagine It side is the Autodesk side of uh, the business, if you will. As far as where we are, well, we're all over the place in North America. So uh, the services organization, which I'm a part of, uh, over 126 members uh, throughout the uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada, um, thousands, tens of thousands of customers we've worked with over the years. We have uh, over 40 office locations throughout the U.S. and Canada. Uh, the organization itself is uh, over 400 people. And we serve a variety of industries. Of course, my focus is on infrastructure and reality capture, but we also specialize in building architecture, manufacturing, PLM, uh, facilities management, CFD, and other aspects as well. Um, but just a little bit of a better understanding of, of who we are. And uh, I'm actually here in uh, Southeast Michigan out of our Troy office. As far as the organization goes, um, we have, in addition to the, the numerous offices, we have mobile training labs, we have dedicated training labs, and we have virtual training labs. So training and education is a big part of the services that we offer our customers. We are an Autodesk uh, premier service provider and a platinum partner in the U.S. and in Canada. So we're Autodesk's largest partner, as a matter of fact, uh, in North America. Um, and it, beyond the services and the, the divisions that we talked about for the practice groups, uh, we also work with data management. We have a dedicated team that deals with data management, uh, focusing primarily around Vault, but other forms of data management as well, uh, simulation, and a software development team. So we have a, an entire team within the organization that is dedicated to creating software either from whole cloth or software that will supplement functionality to Autodesk technology, allow us to customize things or create things that will do what the software won't do out of the box. So that's a little bit more about the company itself. The infrastructure team, which I'm part of, uh, I have uh, 16 people in the organization uh, spread out throughout the US and Canada, uh, people with various industry backgrounds, uh, working with both uh, commercial and government. Um, I, believe we have uh, pretty much uh, all the time zones covered and most of the geographies. Uh, we have uh, people on the team that are uh, PEs, uh, licensed professional surveyors, uh, people from commercial, from government, 
Um, all the people on the team, uh, myself included, come from the industry. So uh, we, we weren't uh, selling photocopiers or anything six months ago. We're uh, industry uh, professionals. And when you're working with us, you're working with not just the individual that you're talking to, but really the whole team. And our collective experiences over the years is a big part of how we serve our customers and how we develop and position services like the one we're going to be talking about here today. So before we get into the particulars of this migration to Autodesk, I wanted to talk about the parent foundation for most of our implementation-based services, and that's our take aim implementation methodology. Um, if you've worked with Imagine It before, you've probably uh, seen this term or it's on our website, it's, it's, it's all over. And it's really the, the foundation for many of our technology adoption-based services. And this was defined uh, quite a few years ago and is really uh, the, the path that we follow in most cases to be able to help an organization, whether they're migrating, let's say, from AutoCAD and uh, SoftDesk, maybe we still have SoftDesk customers, believe it or not, uh, but people that are going from SoftDesk to Civil 3D. Uh, but this same foundational uh, system would be applicable for organizations that are migrating to, let's say, uh, Revit or InfraWorks or Navisworks or pretty much any Autodesk technology. So it's a system based on uh, defining what the objectives are, uh, identifying what the customer's needs are, developing an environment and providing the applicable education, working with the organization to pilot the implementation to basically get it up and running, and then to provide ongoing production assistance and uh, a means of, of support and continuing education. So that's the basic foundation. And uh, it varies in every single instance. So uh, while we have a basic uh, format that that we use. Uh, this is based on best practices and principles. The particulars in every case varies based on the organization's needs, the size, the software, etc. But I just wanted to use this as a reference because as we go forward, uh, this new service is really born from this this fundamental foundation. So, as it pertains to the migration to Autodesk, let's talk about w what is it really. Um, and the name, I think, is hopefully uh, is, is somewhat is somewhat telling in, in what the intent is. But really, what it boils down to is this is a comprehensive service uh, that, again, based on our take aim methodology, that is targeting organizations that are looking at making the transition from a Bentley-based platform to an Autodesk-based platform. Um, and it may seem uh, that uh, th this is, uh, in some respects, might be considered a new thing for some organizations. For others, maybe this is something that they've encountered in the past. But the way we look at it is it's implementation, obviously, because if an organization is coming from Bentley and they're in using inroads or GeoPack or Open Roads or MX or Power Civil or MicroStation, whatever flavor of Bentley technology they're using, uh, there's going to be considerations beyond what we would typically look at if we're taking an organization from let's say AutoCAD to Civil 3D. Because rather than it being from one familiar platform to another relative platform based on the same underlying AutoCAD DWG format, in the case of people migrating from a penalty platform, it's well one of the, well, I think six different conceivable infrastructure based platforms they could be coming from. So the 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 particulars, the details of what's going to be important for those organizations, making that journey from where they are today to where they want to get to varies. So in addition to the things that we talked about before as part of our take aim, we're also looking at workflows and standards. And we'll get into the details a little bit more, but um, just to give you some context, the standards of an organization that is, let's say, AutoCAD land desktop based, and they've been using it for 10 years, 15 years maybe, um, for them to make the migration from Autodesk Land Desktop to Civil 3D, um, there's going to be certain considerations, but things related to, let's say, layers or colors and line types and blocks, those things are directly transferable into the Civil 3D environment. There's not going to be a whole lot of uh, uh, variables or conversion considerations. I mean, there is, of course, continuity of uh, the uh, integrity of the data, but a, a line type that worked in AutoCAD 2014 will 
basically work in 2020 or 2021. But when you're looking at coming from, let's say, inroads to Civil 3D, now we're not talking about blocks to blocks. We're talking about cells to blocks. We're talking about levels to layers and so on and so forth. So there's different considerations that we need to take in, into account when we're working with organizations to do that. And then workflows. So processes an organization may have developed that are, let's say, based on a Bentley platform that involves a certain series of steps or a certain migration of data from the initial uh, stages of a project through final plan production, they may need to maintain for consistency sake or if they're running parallel uh, divisions. So um, one of the things that we're encountering is organizations that are making the whole switch. So they're changing from MicroStation base to AutoCAD base. And sometimes we're dealing with organizations that are bifurcating their, their, their organization or their, their software, and maybe they're creating a new division that does AutoCAD-based stuff, and then they're keeping the Bentley as well so they can maybe serve different customers based on the platform. So we want to maintain as much as possible continuity in their processes and workflows in the Autodesk environment which is, again, somewhat unique when you're dealing with someone who's coming from a different non-DWG-based format. And then there's the matter of automation. So with, uh, with AutoCAD or an AutoCAD-based environment, uh, there's a variety of types of automation. There's uh, Lisp and there's .NET and VBA and all, all kinds of ways that people will uh, customize the environment to perform certain tasks, uh, whether they do that in-house or if that's something that's done uh, as, as a service like through Imagine It. But when you're coming from a completely different platform, uh, that type of functionality is obviously not going to translate directly. So we may have to look at uh, identifying what automation needs are in place now, whether, let's say, for example, you're working in a region where there's a state kit from a DOT and there's certain tools and functionality that's become an integral part of your processes and workflows, and you want to be able to maintain that in its similar format in an AutoCAD DWG Civil 3D environment. So that may necessitate we look at automation more so in a migration-based service versus someone who's coming at it from whole cloth ground up. Data management is another category where we see quite a bit of uh, variables from where they're coming from and where they're going to. So in the Bentley world, we deal, we deal with a lot of organizations that are dealing with file-based um, data management systems, basically files on a server somewhere on a network that they're, that they're sharing and they're using, and that's, that's the way they operate. Others might be using something like... Um, uh, a, a Bentley-based project-wise, let's say, for example, and that's their data repository, and they use that in conjunction with a, uh, a MicroStation-based software. And they want to maintain that type of functionality going forward. They want to have a system that maintains versioning and something that they can use to control process and workflow and uh, you know the, all of the things that the underpinnings that a data management system would entail. So making that conversion from one platform to another involves entirely different considerations. And then lastly, one of the other things that's probably the most unique is the need for migration of legacy data. So we're not talking about standards here. We're talking about DNG, uh, DGN files, and we need DWG equivalents of those. Um, so in some cases, an organization, they're drawing a line in the sand and they're saying, well, from this point forward, everything we do is going to be DWG based. And then from this date back, it's all going to be uh, DGN based. Uh, others need to take all of their legacy data and they need to create a new DWG version of it going forward because they still plan on working on those files, coming back to those projects, maybe at a later date. And they don't want to have to maintain two platforms, a Bentley platform and an Autodesk platform to utilize those legacy files and that legacy data. So that necessitates that we work with them to define a data conversion process so they can convert their, their legacy data to DWG base, and then they can essentially shut off the MicroStation Bentley switch and then go forward without losing the ability to, to leverage that data that they'd already created. So, so those are some of the unique things that are part of this process and, and how it differs from, again, just an AutoCAD based to another AutoCAD based environment. So what the basis of this, from the Imagine It side, what, why have we come up with this? Um, well, the why we talked about, but really what is the, you know, what, what's the foundation for this as far as uh, determining what goes in this, this service, basically? And really what it boils down to is 25 plus years of doing this. 
Um, while the service itself, with its identity, uh, migration to Autodesk, we've been providing migration to Autodesk services, well, for, for as long as I can remember. In fact, my first uh, migration project was in 1997, and I was working with an AEC firm in Metro Detroit that was going from MicroStation to AutoCAD. And I had to work with them to develop a migration, very similar to the things we're talking about here today, uh, converting files and then training 110 uh, designers and engineers how to use AutoCAD while making inferences to things that were familiar to them in the MicroStation world. So talking about the different ways of selecting things, the different way of snapping the things, you know, the procedures that may be different in the two. So it wasn't just AutoCAD 101 training. Uh, it was training that was specific to where they're starting from as far as their knowledge of CAD in general, and then how to make inferences to the AutoCAD equivalents of those. So it's something that I've personally have been doing for uh you know, for, for for many years, but I'm just one team member. We have people in the organization, some have been here even longer than me, that have also been doing these same things. So when we're looking at putting these services together and determining what should be in the box, so to speak, that's not just my, Kevin's decision, that's the decision that we came to collectively as an organization. And obviously the needs of an organization, while they may fall in the same basic framework, are different every single time. Um, we have two projects right now, for example, that are both sub fairly substantial projects where the the services that we're, we're, we're assisting with are considerably different. Both involve education, um, uh, while one is more just AutoCAD, DGN, uh, DWG-based training. The other one is far more comprehensive, dealing with multiple applications. One is file-based. One is a project-wise to Autodesk Vault data conversion. Uh, and one of them we're working with on uh, actually helping them to set conversion matrices up to convert 70,000 DGN files to DWG equivalents and loading them into Vault. So the needs of each organization and the services that we prescribe are, of course, unique in each case. And again, it's based on best, best practices. So the, even though the, the service as, as branded with its identity is new, it, this is not new to us. We've been doing this, like I said, for, for many years. Another thing that really is driving this for us, like I said, we've been doing this obviously for, for quite a while, is uh, in the last year or so, especially in like the last six months, we've seen a real uptick, a big uptick in organizations that are reaching out to us and asking for assistance or making inquiries as to how this process can be can be handled. Um, not quite sure. I have some suspicions what's going on, but uh, there's been a very noticeable increase in organizations looking to make this move. And uh, for that reason, we thought it made sense to to put something out there that explains that this is something that we are well versed in. We have a process in place and we can help these organizations to uh, to make that journey from uh, a Bentley based platform to an Autodesk based platform. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, again, the services is, is structured based on uh, the, the needs of, of the organization. So what's in the service? It's a, like our take aim. It's a multi-phased process. It starts with the discovery, and the discovery is, uh, as the name implies, it's an opportunity for us to get a deep understanding of your current situation. What are you dealing with now? What software specifically are you using? Again, is it Inroads, Geopack, Openroads, MX, Power Civil, MicroStation, or a combination of those things? What are your current standards? And the standards, again, you're not going to be able to take a DGN file and just open it up in DWG and call it, hey, here's our new template. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, if you're on this call, I'm guessing it's a good chance you already understand that. So it's a matter of looking at, well, what, what, what is the standards? What are the standards? And what parts of that do we need to consider uh, porting forward? Do we need, for example, some custom line types that were developed in a uh, microstation-based format that we need to replicate and create in a DWG format? Uh, is there an extensive cell library that will need some manipulation and conversion? And so there's there's a lot to it um, other than just the, uh, you know, the, the, the colors and the line types and, and the real basic aesthetics. There's quite a bit more to it. And of course, the whole data management situation. Is it a file-based system? Is it a data management system? that we're looking at, will it need to be converted? Are they gonna maintain, continue to use, uh, let's say uh, for some reason, maybe they wanna to continue to use project-wise and use DWG in a project-wise environment versus 
translating over to a file-based or to a vault professional environment. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to acquire from the organization. From that, we will put together a, uh, a plan going forward that will look at first the data migration needs and then the environment development. So the data migration, we talked about the different aspects, uh, you know, cells and blocks and line types and references and, and title blocks and, uh, you know, fields and attributes and all of that. So there's, there's a lot of a lot of things that we need to uh, identify uh, and then develop. So going forward, uh, we're going to build a, let's say, in most cases, the civil 3D based environment. And there's going to be things that need to be developed in there. Uh, there may be, as we talked about before, automation. So maybe part of developing the environment and the standards is also implementing some additional functionality. Maybe we're going to add some tools to the ribbon or create a custom ribbon that has a bunch of functionality that's customized that emulates functionality maybe your users were familiar with that came from a state kit that you got from some DOT, or maybe it was some homebrewed stuff that was done in Bentley. Now you need Autodesk to do something similar. So those are all parts of the uh, environment development. Then of course we get onto the education. The education, again, the needs and the, the means that we deliver, the, the education varies in every case. Um, obviously there's gonna be some training on Autodesk something. We're gonna need to cover AutoCAD and probably 3D, uh, Civil 3D and MAP or maybe InfoWorks, Navisworks, Revit, what, whatever the case is. Um, so there's obviously gonna be some some con some con continuous uh, uh, aspects there as far as training goes. But a lot of it is gonna be workflow-based training as well. So beyond just learning the picks and the clicks uh, within an AutoCAD environment, what button do I pick to get the program to do a certain thing or in, uh, you know, MicroStation, uh, you know, I would pick up, you know, identify the point and then call the command in Civil 3D, uh, you know, what is what is that process? You cover all of those things. And then we also would address potentially the data management aspects of it. So if an organization is making a trans transfer of uh, from uh, the uh, you know, a Bentley based uh, environment and again, if they're using project wise, now they're gonna be using Vault, what's the check in, check out process? How does that work different? How do you run reports, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, the support phase. So this is where uh, we've gone through, we've identified the needs, we've developed the environment, we've provided education, we've potentially done some, uh, some automation, some programming, some uh, workflow prescription, set up the data environment, and now we're gonna take and spend time with you piloting a project. Um, and there's various ways that we do that. The most common is uh, project mentoring, where we would literally have the applications expert who's been leading this project with you, either virtually or on site, and be with you as you're initially using the software in a new project. Ideally, we try to get those things timed as well as possible, but um, it, it's a really great way to help minimize the speed bumps that you're inevitably going to encounter when you're doing something on a new platform using new standards. Regardless of the education, there's always going to be uh, some speed bumps. So we're, we're practical about that. We recognize that. And we want to have someone, uh, a support system ready and waiting to help you to deal with those inevitable hiccups as you're starting the process. Once you get through the pilot, the support phase continues with imagine it's technical support and our e-learning and uh, learning management system called Productivity Now, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, one of the things that we found uh, in the last, probably in the last few years that because we've had such a increase in the volume of organizations that are looking at making this change, we're finding some organizations um, don't quite have a crystal clear vision of what their situation is now and what, if any, parts of that they need to migrate going forward, and what the implications are of migration uh, or transferring or translating data and so on. So in some cases, if the customer is having difficulty identifying the details, rather than making too broad of assumptions, we'll work with the organization and we'll carve this first part out as a separate service, like um, something that we would call a strategic process review or a health check, and we would essentially do an analysis of what your current situation is, identify and learn what your interests or your intents are as far as going forward, and then from that provide a prescriptive recommendation of what the remaining part of this implementation would be. And then from there, they can choose options and choose a path forward. Once that's those decisions are made, then we would create a more detailed uh, second step of the process, if you will, that would allow us to uh, to deal with the um, the the rest of the project here. So in some cases we do separate those, probably about a 
quarter of the time that's necessary. Um, but it, it, it's something that we have in place and we found that has, has been helpful because what we don't want to do is go in making too many broad generalized assumptions and then at the end find out that we really didn't uh, achieve the results the customer was looking for because uh, usually you don't know until it's a retrospective that you, you would want to make a decision differently. So we try to minimi minimize that as much as possible. So to get into the little more details of what we're doing throughout this process, we start again with the discovery. And that's really where we're trying to gain an understanding of what your needs are and identify basically to what extent we're going to be migrating versus clean slate. And what I mean by clean slate is a lot of times when organizations, for example, will go from, let's say, um, uh, land, land desktop to civil 3D. Um, because land desktop wasn't as flexible as civil 3D, uh, the standards, the uh, you know the styles, the ways you would create profiles, and the way that uh, uh, gravity structures appear, and there wasn't a whole lot of variables other than the, the colors, layers, and line types. Um, so it, it it didn't really lend itself to a whole lot of flexibility. So organizations would sometimes use this. Uh, as an opportunity to reevaluate their standards and maybe recreate something that is purpose built for civil 3D versus just taking their legacy stuff that may or may not be a good fit for a civil 3D environment and just dragging it forward. Um, so sometimes it, it is a clean slate break. And a lot of times with these organizations we're working with, very little of their legacy stuff, other than maybe migrating some legacy templates and title blocks and things of that nature, will will make the trip. They'll just cut bait, clean slate, new environment. Um, but again, it, it varies on and, and each organization's needs. We talked about the automation needs. Uh, what if anything needs to be developed? And again, we have that dedicated software development team that is uh, well, basically, if if it can be done, they can do it. Is, is the way I like to put it. Uh, the data management stuff, and of course, the education needs. Um, again, if if the needs are not clearly defined, or if we know going into this, we're in the initial conversations about this process. If the organization doesn't have a great sense, or if we don't think the organization has a great sense of what they really want to do or how they want to do it, um, rather than making too many broad assumptions, we'd probably recommend let's let's treat this discovery separately. Let's get this all figured out. Let's come up with some answers, make some decisions, and then move on to the rest of it. So we want to do it once, and we want to do it right as much as possible. So the next stage, that data migration environment development part, is, uh, again, that's where we're getting into the weeds on, okay, so we're converting files. We're going to be creating an AutoCAD environment that looks, in some respects, like your legacy. We're going to take the line types and the cells and the title blocks and the nomenclature and create blocks and labels that are emblematic, uh, representative of what your standards are. And one of the things that's important to remember is an organization's standards and their CAD standards are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, one's based on the other. So CAD standards are obviously based on organizational standards, but organizational standards could be existing center line of a road is a red line that's got a center line line type. And Bentley has a version of that, or uh, MicroStation has a version of that, and Civil 3D slash AutoCAD has a version of that. Um, so those types of uh, of migration of data is pretty pretty straightforward as far as you know your starting point and your destination based on standards. Um, but again, it's not the same in every case. Some organizations, uh, again, clean slate versus something that they're going to migrate and so on. Um, then there's also the, uh, the, we talk about the translation matrix uh, for actually migrating and translating files. So one of the projects that we're currently working on right now is uh, we started, in fact, this was a great example of where we, we compartmentalized the discovery and then the rest of the the, the project into two pieces and we're really glad and I would say I think the customer would say they're really glad they did it that way too because we went in and they thought that they had one set of CAD standards uh, in their microstation based environment and they wanted to use that standard basically as the matrix for the translation to an AutoCAD file format. Uh, at the end of our discovery we learned they had 19 standards that they had been using over the years and 70,000 files comprised of one of 19 different standards. So had we just gone through and assumed we we're going to use one translation matrix for all of their 70,000 files, they were going to have a mess on their hands. So in their case, it was, it was good for them and for us that we were able to more clearly identify what they're coming from and so we can make the path going forward a little more clear. So that way the, the converted files that we're going to be helping them to, to translate will actually be 
uh, more emblematic of what their old standards were. So going forward, they're not going to have a, a, a big hot mess on their hands. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. Uh, and again, the, the need for automation and data, uh, data management, environment development, those things vary on a case by case basis. It's, it's never the same twice. Again, with the training, um, we try to focus as much as possible on gap training um, with an organization that's making this translation. So uh, what I mean by that is if we have users that maybe have some AutoCAD experience, maybe they dabble in AutoCAD occasionally, so they know the basics. They know how to create a file, they know what a layer is, they know how to draw lines, and they know how to snap to objects and so on, but maybe they have uh, some knowledge gaps on uh, creating blocks or maybe uh, you know w whatever the case is there's, so there's so some some things that they're not sure on so we would we would want to whenever possible make the training as concise and as right sized as possible so that uh, we're being respectful of your time we're keeping your people in productivity as much as possible um, and of course keeping the, the cost of the service down right if we're if we're only if we only need to do two days of training versus four days of training obviously that's going to save you save you money so we try to make that as as prescriptive and gap based as much as possible but there's also going to be things if you're going to let's say civil 3d well you're going to need need to know everything about civil 3d or whatever aspects of it you don't already know and the same for vault uh, if you're going to bim 360 or if you're going to um you know doesn't matter uh, whatever else you're migrating to we try to identify exactly what the specific training is so we're giving you no more and no less to make that initial uh, move into the program and then the last part again is the support so the support falls into a couple different sections so the first is the mentoring and that's again where we're going to have the application expert work with you either remote or on site depending on what the conditions are uh, with all the uh, the COVID stuff going on uh, but we've been uh, for well, the last six months uh, we've done very few face-to-face -face interactions but we've been thankfully able to uh, fulfill these services all remote um, working with organizations in, in, in every stage it's been um, we've been very fortunate and I'm, I'm thankful to say that uh, we've uh, we've been able to facilitate these services uh, without a hiccup so to speak um, but we will provide that service and then we'll move on to the productivity now support and e-learning which is after you're up and running, you're on your way, you're inevitably gonna run into questions. Your users are gonna get an error. Something is gonna happen down the road, right? Nothing's perfect. Um, so we have our uh, support services that are designed to uh, tackle that part of it so that you uh, you have someone you can actually talk to and deal with your, uh, that can keep you up and running. And then the last part is the continuing education part. So we're gonna go through, we're gonna create we're going to create a training outline that is going to address the various aspects needed to get you up and running with the program. That said, six months from now, a year from now, two weeks from now, you may pick up a new customer or you may take on a new project type that necessitates that you learn something that maybe you hadn't uh, anticipated at the time that we were making this, this process. So part of our, our e-learning with our productivity now is access to thousands of training classes, videos, workflows that are specific to uh, different applications and different software. So this is a big part of our continuing education and learning. It allows you to keep keep going. And then we also offer is what we would consider stage two training. So let's say that we want to put together a custom hydrology and hydraulics class that deals with SSA and hydroflow. Let's just say, for example, or maybe you want to start doing some dynamo development uh, to do some uh, in-house automation uh, using uh, dynamo within, uh, let's say, a civil 3D environment. We can assist you with those types of things. So that's that's the the service itself in a nutshell it really is designed to cover the where you are now where you want to get to taking our collective experiences putting together a prescriptive path a map if you will to get you from where where you are to where you want to go to as quickly and as painlessly as possible uh, it's something that while again the name the brand name of the service is new we've been doing this for over a quarter of a century in fact, we get into the weeds on the team. We talked about us being an Autodesk Platinum partner, which is good. Um, but the team members that I mentioned before on the infrastructure team, 16 people from the industry. Um, uh, you know, I've been here 25 years. I think most of the people on the team have been in the industry 15 plus years. Some of us uh, are probably on the 
I guess, quite a ways on the other side of that that 15 year number. Um, but we were just uh, probably a couple of months back, we were going through and, and, and counting up the hours or years rather of ex- uh, experience that we have for users that have worked both in an Autodesk and a Bentley based environment. And we've it's over 100 years. Um, in fact, in addition to our, our cross experience, we actually have people on the team here on the services team that were Bentley employees. We have one individual who worked for Bentley for, I think, 13 years. Um, and he also worked for Autodesk. And uh, so we, we have the right people on, on the team with the right experience in the background. We have many of these engagements, the types of engagements under our belts that we've done for many, many years. Uh, like I said before, we have a dedicated data management team. If you have some very heavy lifting to be done in a data management situation, if you need customization done, um, if you need data uh, ported for you, migrated, or you need guidance on how to do that, uh, our team can do that. And then our software development team, which again, dedicated, they they don't do classroom training. They're not doing things like I'm doing right here today. They're developing software. They're either augmenting functionality from Autodesk technology or creating things from whole cloth. Um, and uh, again, just to kind of underscore our experience, while we're an Autodesk partner, we're also Bentley Developer Network members. So our development team, because we have been working with Bentley technology for many years and working with ProjectWise and with uh, with uh, Autodesk Vault Professional, and we've, as you know, again, just out of necessity, we've had to work with companies that had to make a translation from one platform to another. So we've done a fair amount of development in the Bentley environment as well as, of course, the Autodesk environment. So these are all the experiences and the things that we've we've done over the years. To give you a little more clarity on the services organization, um, I'm part of the solutions, consulting solutions team, and uh, we deal with scope services. So those are things that are going to be specifically designed or catered to the needs of an individual organization. Um, we, you know, we talk about data management, PLM, but we have facilities management team. We have a reality capture team that deals with laser scanning. But those are all very specific and customized to a given organization's needs. Then the other side of the services team is our perform, uh, performance support and training. That's where our technical support team is. That's the side of the organization that does a lot of our uh, live online open enrollment training. So for example, if you were to go to the Imagine It website or if you talk to your account representative and you wanted to sign up a couple people to the next live online AutoCAD 2021 uh, fundamentals class or civil 3D class or whatever, um, on regular rotation, the things that you'll find on our website as far as the open enrollment live online training classes, that's the team that handles that. Um, so we're all collectively working together. We um, we cross pollinate from time to time. Uh, the support team, the technical support team, is um, it says 17. It's actually I think 20 people on the support team now that uh, deal with the daily technical support. So this team of individuals um, are all industry based people themselves. They're not part of the solutions team. They're not part of my, uh, my my organization. They're part of the technical support team, which means they're not training classes. They're not doing um, uh, you know, webcasts, they're not, uh, you know, getting on planes or staying in hotels. They're at their desks, at their phones, dealing with customer support needs. Uh, we service customers from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Uh, we have a, a variety of ways of contacting them, including the telephone, which uh, which is, believe it or not, is something we do. We, we talk to our customers. Um, we have systems that allow you to uh, uh, track your case your uh, your logging generate reports and then when this team if these if this team is overwhelmed then uh, they have a backstop of 126 people on the services side I talked about that cross pollination so uh, people on my team let's say for example uh, we've got two or three individuals who have a couple open days well as a backup to the support team if need be they can tap our team to assist with applicable uh, technology support so we all work together as an organization but our focus is to make sure we're taking care of our customers so after you've gone through this process and you're up and running and you've gone through your pilot and two weeks down the road you get a file from somebody and it's giving you an error or the you're trying to install a service pack and you're having a problem or you're, you have some sort of a technical issue. You can actually talk to one of our people right here in U.S. and Canada um, and uh, who have industry experience and have the backstop of uh, uh, over 125 people. As far as the flavors of support, uh, Imagine it offers are what we call our e-support. So anybody who's a subscription customer with Autodesk software with Imagine it, they have access to our, our e-support um, that's email based um, or online. And we have an SLA of 
next business day, although usually we're within eight hours. Um, and then we have the uh, the next level up, what we call our priority support. So it's the same support options, plus you have telephone, email, and screen sharing. So if you're having a problem and the support person wants to, you know, see your screen and see what's happening, or it wants to, you know, kind of get in there and remote in and help you with something, then we have the, the means to do that. That's part of that service. Uh, we have an SLA of four hours, but generally we hit it in two, which means when you log a call you, or you, you know, email for support, within a couple hours, you're going to actually be talking to somebody uh, working with you to, to solve that problem. And it's not going to be days um, where, you know, you're basically adrift waiting to get a question answered that's mission critical and, and uh, you know, preventing you from doing your job. We want to make sure we're there to help people. We also offer what we call design assistance hours with our priority support. And basically that's uh, technical support that gets beyond the, I got an error, to how do I. Um, so it's not training, but if you do run into the, hey, how do I import an ASCII file? I can't remember how to do that um, to create a, a, a DTM service or whatever the question is. Then you have uh, two hours of design assistance that you can utilize for that. And then the last part here is our productivity now. So this is our, uh, our e-learning uh, LMS knowledge sharing platform. So basically what this gives you is ongoing continuous learning opportunity where you can go to our library of uh, literally thousands of classes. So Autodesk has partnered with, um, uh, you are probably familiar with Eagle Point's Pinnacle series. So this is based on their Pinnacle series. So it's the Pinnacle series content from Eagle Point and all of the Ascent stuff that Autodesk, or excuse me, imagine it creates for Autodesk. That's the foundation for the education. So it's a tremendous wealth of information. Of course, Civil 3D, AutoCAD stuff's in there, but it's, there's a whole lot more to it than that. Revit, Navisworks, pretty much anything Autodesk makes, we have training in there. So what this allows you to do is as you go through and you go through the process, you take the, uh, we go through the training that we prescribe at the time to get you up and running. But again, two months down the road, three months down the road, you take on a new project or a customer necessitates you get up to speed on maybe you got to learn some Revit fundamentals or maybe you got to learn a little more about Navisworks. Well, if you don't have time to take training, you can use the e-learning. You can go on and you can sign up for a class. Or if you have our uh, professional version, then as a manager, let's say you're uh, you, for the organization, you're, you want to prescribe training and actually assign training courses to your employees um, by group or by individual, then you can do that as well. So it's a great way to continue to learn so as going forward you're going to need to stay up on the latest version of the software or you're going to need to learn something beyond what you're doing today uh, so it, it provides that in addition to the e-learning there's also capacity within the system that really facilitates sharing of best practices and workflows which is a big part of helping people to really understand how to use technology so training is generally what i would call picks and clicks you know, what, what buttons do I pick to import an ASCII file to create a DTM surface? Okay, great. So you're going to learn how to do that. Then you're going to learn how to use an alignment to sample the surface to create a profile. Okay, great. You're going to learn all the mechanics of it. But how do you, how do you stitch those, the, those mechanics together into a process that allows you to perform a particular type of task? So with workflows we can create a essentially a step-by-step -step series uh you okay you start here you open up this uh, this program you ins you import this then you go to this next step and then you open this and you so it takes you through a very specific uh set of steps to get you to perform a particular type of workflow so it's more than just that uh, we have organizations that use the productivity now portal uh, for their own standards. So they'll take their CAD standards and they'll publish their CAD standards on our productivity now. They will use this system to create their own custom workflow. So if you have a particular way that you want users to, for example, convert a, uh, a legacy DGN file to a DWG using Axiom, and you want to use a certain conversion template, you can literally create videos, workflows, and uh, prescribe that to your your employees so they can learn how to do it exactly the right way. There's also, of course, a huge library of uh, basically FAQ or knowledge base information. So if they want to do a search on a particular keyword, uh, they can either take a training class or they can read white papers or documentation. on it. And really, at the end of the day, what this does is this lends to increased productivity. The whole idea is to provide people with support. So
so that when they inevitably do run into a problem, they can get that problem solved and get back to work. Um, it provides them with education. So when you inevitably need to learn more than what you know today, because for whatever reason, a new version of the software, or you're taking on something newer, you're going to actually use some of those other programs in the AEC collection. You have the means to educate yourself to increase your abilities to make you work faster and, of course, have a higher level of productivity.